Let's show you how you can create amazing panoramic images that have much more impact on the viewer than a 3x2 and a 4 or a 4x3 image. And where better to show you how to do panoramic photography than here in the Italian Dolomites of Northern Italy. When it comes to creating panoramic images, ideally what you want to be doing is working from a tripod. You can do handheld panoramic photography, but I'll come to that just a little bit later on. You want basically a good sturdy tripod with a spirit level in the tripod itself. And then also you want ideally a very good solid tripod head again that has a spirit level in it. Why? Because you need to be able to level off everything so that when you swing from left to right or right to left when you're doing swinging the camera around, panning the camera around, that basically what you want to be doing is keeping the horizon as straight as possible. Yes, you can get specialized panoramic heads, but for the majority of the time, for the majority of you out there creating panoramic images, a good sturdy tripod and a good tripod head is what you're going to need. Personally, when it comes down to using either a ball head or a geared head, I personally prefer to use a geared head. I find it much more precise than a ball head. That's going to come down to personal choice though. So you pay your money, you make your choice though. When it comes to your tripod head and the attachment that you're going to use to get your camera onto the tripod head, my personal recommendation to you would be to have an Arca Swiss plate attachment. Why? Because you can use an L bracket on your camera. So instead of having your tripod head here, if you can imagine your tripod head here, you're not turning it like this. You're physically getting the camera and then turning it on top there of the the tripod head so you'll see it's a lot better for when you're panning from left to right or right to left. I'll be doing some b-roll as well so you can see what it is that I'm doing and explaining it a lot easier for you so you can understand why it is that I'm explaining it the way I am and trying to teach you the way that I am. Lens choice when creating panoramic images is actually quite critical. Why? Because if, you're, if you have a, a wide angle lens, it's far too wide, so for example, 16 millimeter, and you're panning from left to right. If you're, for example, in a cityscape, or in the, let's just say in the middle of a city at ground level, and you're in an old city, you've got cobblestones on the floor, Watch what happens with the distortion, how much more pronounced it becomes when you create a panoramic image. When you're creating a series of images going from left to right or, or right to left, you will see when you stitch them together back at the digital workstation, the, the distortion that is there, you'll have this huge bend in the bottom of your picture where you've been going around with a wide angle lens. What I would suggest to you is actually to work from something around a focal length of around 40, 50 millimeters. That would be your widest, I would say. Sometimes I've done 35. I do that with my tilt shift and then an adapter on the front. But what you'll find is, say from, let's say 35, 40, 50 millimeters, you're going to get images with less distortion in the foreground than you would normally have if you're using a wider angled lens. Now, what I will say is if you're going to use long focal length lenses, so for example, I use 100 to 400 a lot to do panoramic images, try to avoid having stuff kind of directly in the foreground with it. Why? Because you're going to then have to start doing focus stack uh, panoramic images. Yes, you can do them, but then it's going to add into the amount of work that you're going to be doing back at the digital workstation. But for example, here, look at this huge, beautiful vista behind me here in the Dolomites. It begs to do panoramic photography. And a lot of the time I'm here in the Dolomites doing long lens panoramic images because it really suits it with the mountain scenery that you have here.
In the beginning, I mentioned that there is some specialist panoramic gear that you can buy. It's quite expensive. However, there are one or two things that you can do to remove certain things that you're going to find when you do panoramic photography. The main thing that you're going to need to contend with is called the parallax error. What's the parallax error? Well, after this sequence, what I'm going to do is film a sequence back home and show you there where it's a lot easier actually to show you than here in the Dolomites. I'll show you there what it is that I'm talking about with parallax error. But what's the, a cheap sort of way that you can get into panoramic photography and really start to remove as much as you can of that parallax error? Because that's at the end of the day what I'm trying to do as a professional photographer is design out problems. I don't want problems in my images, I want things designed out. One of the things that you can do that will help a lot is this. It's just a rail. So this, for example, will go onto my camera. And again, as I'm filming this, you'll see some B-roll flick up. So I'll be putting this on the Arca Swiss. And you can see here, there's an Arca Swiss plate here. And what it does is the, the, the camera lens will be here and the camera is back here. So that when the camera is being angled round, instead of the camera panning round like this, it's panning round like this. Does it make a difference? You'll see in the next sequence just how much difference it makes using one of these and trying to design out things before they even get into your images. I said I wanted to show you something that illustrates the parallax effects and why it is that you shouldn't, for example, take your camera and turn it over like this. So what I've done is I've set up my 5D Mark IV and what it's going to do is when this next sequence starts is you're going to go from regular uh, 16 by 9 this way to actually vertical just so I can demonstrate the parallax effect and why it is that you should do particular things and why you shouldn't do other things instead. Because as I said as a professional what I want to do is I want to engineer things out of my images so I don't want problems in there. So I'll show you the setup so you can see exactly what it is that I'm doing each time. There is my 5D Mark IV. So you'll see it's pushed over like this. This is not the way to do panoramic images. And what I've done to illustrate the parallax effect is you'll see that there's the line there in the table. So I've tried to line things up so you've got something here and then you've got something here. And I've specifically chosen this so that you can see the blue top moving when I pan the camera from left to right or right to left. You can then see the parallax effect and why it is that you shouldn't, that you absolutely should not put your camera like this when you are doing panoramic photography. So let's show you on the back of the camera what happens when it is like this. So we're on the back of my 5D Mark IV. Now what you can see now is you can see there's that, uh, there's the jar there and behind it there's the small can that's got the, uh, the blue top. Now watch what happens. You should, if you watch very closely, you should see what happens to the blue top when I pan from right to left. You should see it start to move. So that's the parallax effect. So you, let's go the other way and again watch how it starts moving. Now of course it has relied on me trying to line everything up but you can see or you should see there's that parallax effect with that blue top. So let's show you the next thing that you could do to start to engineer out the parallax effect from your images. So this is the next methodology that I want to show you. So you can see my camera is now upright instead of being tipped over to the side there. So apart from balance issues, which again, you need to be engineering out of your photography, you'll see, and what I've tried to do, you'll see, for example, when I take the camera from right to left, left to right, you'll see there's still a little bit of parallax there. And that is actually quite difficult at times to line up, for example, the example that I've got here, this jar of pasta, and then behind there's like a, uh, a bottle of water, which has got that, uh, that blue top. So you'll see there's still some parallax error, but you can see on the table, I've got that 19 centimeter rail that I talked about in the Dolomites. 
and you'll see it will make a difference. It should make a difference. It might, maybe for some people, maybe negligible, but for me, this is what it's all about. It's trying to create, uh, not create problems, but engineer out problems. So you can see it, do, it will make some difference, but you'll have to make your own choices in this. The next example, as I said, so you could see that my camera was set up vertically on the top of my, uh, of my geared head. So I'm going to go from right to left. Again, watch the blue topped bottle in the background and you will see that there is still a little bit of parallax error there. Now hopefully, as I turn it back again, when I put the rail on, you'll see that it's been diminished somewhat. Now it won't perfectly remove it on this particular example because of the way that the geared head is. Now I do have a ball head and what I might do actually is just see because of the way the ball head is engineered because the camera will be more in the middle rather than with the geared head you should see probably zero actually parallax error but that's that's with the camera vertical uh, Arca Swiss plate L plate on the camera. Let's switch to the rail. The third scenario that I want to show you with my geared head. So you can see there's this rail here and the difference is that when I'm going to be taking the camera from right to left or left to right, the lens is back here. And what that's going to do is it will then start to engineer out some of the parallax error. For example, when I'm going, this would be an extreme version of parallax error. Notice that the, where the blue bottle is there because I'm then panning around. This is what's going to happen when you put your camera over to the side. Ideally, when you're going, doing panoramic photography, you want the camera basically to be as far back here, going around that nodal point, so that then you're engineering out the, the parallax errors all the time. This is what it's about when you're doing photography professionally. You don't want to be introducing errors into your photography. Let's show you on the back of the camera what happens now I've added the rail on. So now with the rail. Now, obviously what does rely on, and it's quite difficult to get everything lined up, is that obviously you can see that the camera is zoomed in, going towards the, uh, the jar there and then that bottle. Now, trying to obviously get my camera to be completely parallel to everything over there isn't that easy either. So bear that in mind here. So let's try the rail and see what happens when it goes around. Notice, if you can, there is much, much less parallax error that is going on in the background. This is why you want to add on a rail. So what you should see is basically that bottle there, that blue bottle, it's hardly moving at all. Why? Because of the way the camera has been brought back, that it's swinging around there, that's panning, panning around that point, that nodal point. So don't, don't sort of, as I said, put your camera over to the, the left hand side there. It's not a good idea. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to get my, the ball head that I've got and I'm going to show you what that difference make, what the difference that makes because uh, that is going to be a lot more central uh, with the camera going around rather than the, the geared head. But I personally use a geared head but you can see although there's a, probably a tiny bit in there of the parallax error. It's a lot less than swinging your camera over to the left hand side. Let's go get the ball head. This is the final setup that I want to show you. So what you will see is that I've changed my tripod head for a ball head. What's the difference between this ball head and then the geared head? Well, when the camera is panning from left to right, this is a lot more central. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, come on, why is it you're telling us to engineer out problems and you're not actually using this yourself? It's just because for me, the difference is quite minimal from what I can really see between this and the geared head. So I prefer basically to use my geared head. It's a lot more precise because trying to set up a ball head and make sure everything is right isn't always easy. But there you go, so that's the next setup and it's the final setup that I'm going to show you. So what we can do is we can then demonstrate that parallax effect there when you can see things moving 
from left to right when they are in the foreground. So this is actually what I should say as well, is that this is more for the wide angle variety of lenses rather than long lens panoramas. But let's show you the parallax error on the back of my camera or the lack of it. Okay, so this is the ball head now. So the, the front of the lens is a lot more central on the tripod rather than the geared head, but it's for me a minimal difference. But you will see that when I turn, it's uh, not that easy actually with this particular head to smoothly pan it from left to right. You will see that there is hardly any parallax error at all. Now, something you've got to bear in mind, as I said, the difficult thing with really trying to get this to show, the really difficult thing to, to do with this is actually to get everything parallel this way. So it's parallel with the front of the camera, parallel with the background there, parallel with the two, the two objects in the, in the foreground there to really show you why it is you shouldn't do it. But hopefully what you're getting is a good idea of that parallax error so that when I'm doing this, when I'm going from left to right, right to left, that basically you can see that the parallax error has been diminished so much that this is why that I personally try to engineer things out. Anyway, let's get into the next section. Now you've seen the effects of the parallax error. Now, once you've got your series of images that you've created for your panoramic image, the, the big image that you want to create, you're going to need to stitch them together. What are the options? Option number one is Adobe Photoshop. Option number two is Adobe Lightroom. And the third option, which I can think of off the top of my head, is a piece of software called PT GUI, which is extremely popular with a number of people that do a lot of panoramic images. I've used it very, very briefly a long time ago, but I personally always revert back to Adobe Lightroom. That's my personal preference. My next preference at the moment is Adobe Photoshop. Why? What's the difference between Lightroom and Photoshop? Well, with Photoshop, when you start layering the different images together, the stack of images that you've got there, you can, if you're trying to line things up, you can use the blend mode of difference in order to line up different images that are going from left to right or right to left or even up and down because you can do vertical panoramas, don't forget that. So that can help over and above what Lightroom can do because sometimes Lightroom isn't always giving you what you want results wise in the uh, in the final panoramic image that it's actually creating there so you pay your money you make your choice of course all of these different softwares they do have trial periods so do go out and have a look at each one and see which one suits you best for the panoramic images that you want to be able to create Does subject matter really matter when it comes to panoramic photography? Can you not just blast your way across the scene doing a huge image? Well, no, you really do still have to put some thought into what it is that you're doing with a panoramic image. You're dealing with a much bigger scene in front of you. So you're gonna to have to learn to fill the frame, which I'll come on to with the composition in a minute. So don't think that for example you can stand here and just go well i'm going to go from there all the way over to there and it's going to look absolutely amazing it doesn't work like that with panoramic photography there are ways and means of doing panoramic images to make them look a lot more striking than just blasting your way across the scene it doesn't work think very very carefully how it is that you are going to frame up your panoramic images because that will matter significantly when you start cropping it back at the digital workstation. Yes, you've got kind of some leeway when you're cropping, but seriously, my personal opinion and what I always teach people is think about what it is that you're doing before you start and then it will help you when you get back to the digital workstation because then you should really see what it is that you thought about in the field come to life in that digital workstation when you process it. So think very carefully about your subject matter. It's not just a case of going, I'm gonna do that. It, just, it doesn't work, I promise you.
Composition is, of course, critical when it comes to panoramic photography. Don't think you can, as I said in the previous segment, just do a huge, great wide image and it's just going to work just like that. It doesn't. There are things you're going to have to think about just as when you were composing a 3 by 2 a 4 by 3 or a, or a square image. Leading lines, foreground interest, things that lead you in, not just the leading lines going from point A to B and whatever, just to take you in there. It might not be a line, but those points of interest there, the subject matter, the light, of course, I'm always talking about light. I do prefer the light. You can see now, as I've been filming, the light is coming and going. It looks a bit flat here. Over there, you can see, for me, the composite light over there, the composition that I would put in, there's a lot nicer. There's dimension in the image. Think about all these different things. Learn to fill your frame when it comes to panoramic images. Don't have great empty areas of space in a panoramic image. It looks horrible. So think very carefully about that and of course there's the ratio that you're going to crop to so I've mentioned obviously a regular image three by two four by three a square image here in panoramic photography we're composing to a, a 17 by 6 a 2 by 1 or a 4 by 1 why those particular ratios why do I work to those particular ratios that's the old film ratios that I work to why do I work to those they just work they really do try them you can in Lightroom for example in Photoshop you can create your own ratios so you can crop to those particular ratios give it a go see what happens when you start composing those ratios how much neater and nicer the panoramic images that you're creating and composing look Let's take you through some practical steps of actually creating that panoramic image. So as mentioned, or I think I mentioned, I'm actually going to do a few different panoramas as I'm here in the Dolomites and it just begs for panoramic photography with all these mountain scenes. So behind the camera there is a mountain scene. There is, it's I think one o'clock in the afternoon, but there is nice shadows that are that are there on the scene so it's creating the dimension in the image which I was talking about earlier on as part of that composition the light is it would be better with a late afternoon light but uh, there we go there's still dimension on there you can still get a good idea anyway what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how I set up my tripod then my camera and the settings that I'm going to go through and what I'm thinking in order to try to create a panoramic image so you can see exactly what it is that I'm looking for and what I'm going to end up with. So let's get going on some of those practical steps. Whenever you set up your tripod, it doesn't matter if it's going to be for a panorama or any photo, make sure that if you have a spirit level here, that this spirit level is level. You want this tripod base completely level so that when you start panning the camera from left to right or from right to left that basically there's going to be minimal disruption when it's going along that the camera stays level at every single opportunity that it's going around so first things first make sure that that's level this is the scene that I'm going to be doing a panorama of so basically this mountain scene from just sort of around there something I want to make you aware of though is when you are panning the camera from left to right or from right to left do not under any circumstances take your camera and do that why because as you will have seen when I demonstrated the problems with parallax error when you're turning around you're panning the camera around from from left to right or from right to left the potential problems of introducing parallax error are immeasurable when you're doing that what I try to teach people is get things out get those errors out that you're going to introduce into your photography that's what I'm all about I don't want people to be creating stuff and what it's doing is that they're finding errors in their photography afterwards it what needs to be as good as possible all the time don't do it so why do I have an L bracket on my camera I'll show you so why do I have an L bracket on my camera it makes doing panoramas so much more easier now ideally the camera needs to be directly above the middle point of 
the tripod head there. It's not, but so there may be some parallax if your eye was doing a, a wide angle panorama. However, I am actually going to be doing a long lens panorama onto those mountains there. So it shouldn't matter too much, but why in L bracket, look how much better that is when that turns around there, rather than it being awkwardly over to the side and then it's panning around, introducing parallax errors. It's a lot more central and you will get a lot better images, a lot better stitching as well in the software back at the digital workstation. So don't, under any circumstances, tilt your camera off to the left. Get an L bracket, make sure you've got an Arca Swiss plate. It will help your panoramic photography tenfold, I promise you. So we've leveled our tripod base, the spirit level that's in there, that's level. The next thing to do is make sure that this is level, this axis here. So make sure that this is level. So on the back of my camera, which you hopefully can see, if not, I'll have to lighten it up in post-production, is there's a spirit level that's showing this is level. The next thing to do is check your scene when you're going around, that at each point that you want to turn this, that that spirit level there is level when it's going across the scene. So I'm just gonna turn it little by little. I'm just gonna make sure that every single turn, that that is level. Which means if it's not level, that the tripod legs will then have to be adjusted at some point along the line. So when this is going across the scene, then yes, you can see it's pretty much level all the way across. It, it, it is actually as level as, that, as, it, as it can be. So that's exactly what I want. I want to be turning that camera from left to right, creating my panorama, making sure it's level all the way across. I don't want it, for example, if I was just to turn my camera over this way, like this. I don't want to be having my camera that's uneven because it's then going to introduce errors. I don't want errors in my photography. I want to engineer them out all the time. So that's what I have to do. The next thing that I need to think about is the actual scene in front of me. You can see I've changed lenses now. I'm on 100 to 400. I'm gonna go into this mountain here. I'm gonna be doing a panorama from there until roughly, if I can get it right there. Now in the scene, there's some houses just here and there's some houses there. So if you remember what I said about the composition, it's about filling it up, putting in those points of interest. So you can see there's the shadows there that's coming in. There's the houses. There's all sorts of things in there that will aid that panoramic image. So it's not the first one I'm going to do. I am going to do others. But let's get this one in the bag and let's get going with some panoramic photography. A quick point that I forgot to mention is focusing. So what I've done is I focused a third of the way into the scene. I've then taken off autofocus so that when the camera pans from left over to the right hand side, what it's not doing is it's keep hunting for the autofocus and then ruining things. So focus, pre-focus, take off the autofocus and then start taking your pictures. So you've set up your tripod, you've levered off the head, you've made sure you've composed where it is that you want to do your picture. You've then pre-focus and you've taken off the autofocus and you've got your exposure correct so everything is there what do we do next so each time you take a picture you want to overlap it by a third you'll notice or you might be able to see hopefully on my camera you can see there's the grid lines there so i've got the rule of thirds set up now at the moment i can see over here this sort of line here where it's coming down when i then turn the camera to the left I want this line here to be where this line is here so for example all I have to do is just turn like a quarter of a turn I guess it is on my tripod there and then I would take a picture and then I would think okay where's the line now it's just beyond the peak it's about what a half a centimeter beyond the peak so I then take my picture again and then put it there it's overlapped by a third keep doing that through the scene and so you've then got all of the images in your sequence and then you stitch the images together in the digital workstation. That's basically how I'm doing panoramic images. As I said, I'm going to do a few different ones if I can while I'm here because at times it's not easy filming here in the Dolomites at the moment just because it's actually quite cold and it's affecting the camera that I'm filming with. But in any case, that's 
what I'm doing. So overlap by a third. So again, you know, here I can see where it is here. You can see that shadow coming down. Let's just put it there. I take my picture and so on. And that's a little bit of a, an easy way of doing those panoramas. We'll do a couple more scenes so you get more of an idea again. Okay, the second panorama that I want to show you is this place here. It is a stunning vista that you can get on top of a mountain pass called Paso Giao here in the Dolomites. So let me take you quickly through what it is that I've done. I've actually already done my panorama, but I'll show you the setup and what it is that I'm thinking. And then you can think about getting inspired to come up here yourselves as well. So this is the second panorama that I'm going to do. Basically, you can see there's this mountain range here. What I'm wanting to do, and hopefully not sink down in the snow, is do a panorama from roughly there across to there. And some were cutting across probably around there. Now, there's no direct light on the mountain, but look at that beautiful colour in the sky. The GoPro's picking it up as mostly yellow. I can tell you now it's pink. It looks stunning. I'm probably going to do another one just because the colour's changed so dramatically in the last couple of minutes since I've been filming. Now, uh, technique-wise, so this is levelled off again here. I've got my base levelled off here. What I've done is I've then levelled the camera. I've levelled this here. You can see again that I'm stood... Uh, I'm, I've turned my camera portrait orientation, which is what you should be. You shouldn't be in landscape orientation you want portrait orientation because it will give you much more image to play with look at the color on that sky you can probably see there on the back of the camera it's a lot better than it is on a gopro so yeah so basically that's leveled off so that when i'm panning the camera from left over to the right there so when it's going across here like this that it's all level i want everything to be level i've pre-focused i've taken off the focus and then it's probably going to take probably maybe a dozen shots or so. How many shots do you take for a panorama? It really depends on how big you want the panorama to be, how much you want to include in it. But remember, composition is absolutely key with these panoramas. You don't want to just blast it from all the way over there to over there. It won't really make sense. And of course, this, for example, is a lot closer to the image than this is. So the focal length is going to be a little bit different. But anyway, I'm going to get this panorama because you can see the colour is looking stupendous. Let's get that pano and then let's show you the results coming up. Okay, so another panorama that I want to show you is here up at a place called Paso Jiao. And uh, it's, there's a beautiful mountain scene behind me. Now, if I just take the GoPro and then just show you what it is that I'm talking about, it's this. Now, when it comes to panoramic photography, it's so easy to just go, I'm going to take all of that. Don't. What I'm doing is I've got 100 to 400 on and I'm concentrating on, if you can see this mountain here, so I'm going from there and then I'm going to do a pano right until there and from the experience what I believe is going to happen is that should crop nicely to 16 sorry 17 by 6 so basically that's sort of going to be on a third that'll be in the middle that'll be on the other third and you've got all these different layerings there the different um the different parts of the landscape to take you in there there's some leading lines in there going in there you can see this sort of jig zigzag going up there and then the, obviously the mountains themselves so that's what i'm going to do again taking you back to the setup of what it is that i'm doing with my camera it's leveled off make sure this is leveled off make sure you're in vertical orientation so that you've got more room to play with when you actually stitch the images together focus so i'm just going to focus for example a third of the way in make sure your your spirit level is adjusted so for example if i just adjust my spirit level so it's green there we go so basically that's level and what should happen is then if i slowly go around the scene again you should see that my spirit level because everything is 
level is then level when I go round. So it may be a tad off here and there. I am on snow, so it's highly likely to actually move. But there you go, that's what's going to happen when I start panning around. Now there is a polarizer on the front. Don't polarize too much because it can cause some strange effects when you stitch it together. But there you go, that's another one that I'm trying to do and I'm hoping is going to work. By the way, that's the effect of the polarizer there. You can see how much how how much bluer that's become there, whereas if I then pan it around, watch the effect in the sky there, which you may be able to see. This is why you've got to watch those polarizers. So if I bring it back again, if I take the polarization off a little bit, let's take it to around about there, and then when I then pan the camera around, it's not going to be so pronounced, and that's what you want to avoid because it will give you very strange effects. So that's a, that's another panoramic image that's here in the Dolomite. Hopefully I can find a couple more for this tutorial. In the beginning of my tutorial on panoramic photography, I mentioned that you can buy specialist gear to do panoramas. One of those specialist piece of gear, actually I don't have, but does help, is when you want to do something called multi-row panoramas. I've got a scene behind me up at the top of a mountain whereby I've got 100 to 400 on my camera, but actually it would be better if I had a 70 to 200 to get really what I wanted. So what I've had to do instead is a multi-row panorama. What do I mean by multi-row? Well, let me explain. This is the scene that was behind me, so you can now see it a lot clearer. Now what I wanted to do panorama-wise was just somewhere around here, there's a cross. And now what I wanted to do is basically capture a panorama that cut away from there and then went over to here, up here and then across. Now the problem with the 100 to 400 is it goes in far too close. It crops in something like across here. So what I've had to do is take a row of images that basically goes include some of the sky and then the mountain cut off here and then put the camera down and then go from there. Actually going, for example, if you can imagine going across there like this and then going across there like this. And then you should be able to join this together in your panoramic software to create one big, huge, multi-row panor multi panorama that's actually huge megapixels but will actually give you a lot of room to play with as far as getting your panorama that you've got in your head. So as I said, for me, what I want is I want it from basically there going across and then up and then going over there. That's what I want with my multi-row panorama. You've seen a lot of long lens panoramas. Well, how about I use the rail that I showed you as part of the gear that I carry around. And then a 50, I've got a 50 mil tilt shift on that rail. And I'm gonna do a scene which you can see behind me, a very, very famous scene here in the Italian Dolomites. This is Santa Maddalena Alta. Let me explain what it is that I'm doing and my thought processes behind this particular panorama. So there is my rail set up on my tripod. As always, this is completely level. Before I put this on, I made sure that the spirit level that was in here, I just come round here, this spirit level here, this one was level as well. Then what I've done is I put on the rail. So this is the 19 centimeter, I think, rail. Yes, it's a 19 centimeter rail there. You can see what it does. So you have to be uh, working slightly differently with your tripod because the tripod head, the geared head that I'm using is at a, a different angle here. But you can see what it does. It pulls the lens back. And so therefore, when the camera is panning around, if, you, if I come around here, it might be easier to show you. Just find the best way to see this. You can see what it's doing. So it's not, for example, swinging around. If I just put my monitor back on so I can see it's not swinging around like this. It's not panning like this, it's actually panning like this from my wrist, if you can imagine. So 
So that's basically what this rail is doing. It's helping remove anything, any errors, any parallax errors that might be in the image. Now, what am I actually going to do a panorama of? Well, obviously, Santa Maddalena. Now, you can get this shot with a 35mm focal length, roughly, from this position here or just down there. There's a bench a lot of people go to. But what I wanted to do, what I thought about, and I thought was ideal, actually, for this scene, is that I wanted to go really from over here, include the road, so coming down here, come across, and then come up here. So I don't want to include too much of this mountain here, and I don't want to include too much of this mountain here. It's this that interests me. And obviously there's the light, so you can see, for example, just there, there's some flare that's coming in if I just remove it there. So I've taken, I don't know, I guess it's a dozen shots maybe, going from panning from left over to the right. So what that should do is it should give a very nice panorama. So I talked at the beginning about filling your frame. So if you can imagine, there's a third of a sky there, there's a third of the mountains there, and then sat on the third, what would be say like here is Santa Maddalena Church there. But if you can imagine this cropped off up say here and then here, there's the panorama going across there like that. That's what I'm doing with this particular panorama. So yeah, there you go. Pretty easy setup. This uh, rail here, I think it cost me something like 15 euros or 20 euros, something like that. Not very much money. It's a no name brand from what I remember. I don't remember it having a name and it's proved very, very useful. So can I d say, for example, I don't want to imagine coming to a scene like this and just messing it up. I want to get a scene like this. I've waited for the light all day to be there. Well, I haven't been here all day, but I know roughly when the light's going to stop being on the church. Come here at the opportune moment to get it there, get all the, the levels of light that are going in there to create that three-dimensional look that I'm always after. Enjoy the panorama. So there you go, there's a, a tutorial on doing panoramic photography where you've seen a, a number of different scenarios here in the Northern Dolomites. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below, as always. If you've got any questions, then please do ask and I will try to answer them where I can. So I don't know everything about panoramic photography, but I've certainly done a lot of panoramic photography over the years that I've been a professional photographer. What I'm going to do when this signs off is I'm actually going to give you a segment of some of the images that I've done over the years, some of the panoramic images that I've done, and you can see the variety. So it's not just big, wide, open vistas in landscapes, it's cityscapes as well, all sorts of stuff. So keep watching for that, and then hopefully you'll like it. Thank you so much for joining me on this tutorial. It's really appreciated all the... the uh, the subscribers that I've got and everybody else that comes along and comments, you know who you are. It's appreciated. Take it easy, folks. See you again on the next vlog sometime, somewhere soon. Goodbye and take care.
Thank you.